get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Sal Orwell. He's co-founder of Examine.com. They have over 41,000 scientific research references on nutrition and supplementation. The first two years generated no revenue. And he bootstrapped Examine.com from zero to over $1 million. And Examine.com is his sixth entrepreneurial venture. And he also founded AudienceOwl.com. Sal, thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you for having me, Jeremy. You know, there's so many questions I can ask about just that. And because I want to get in this fun fact is you didn't start off as Sal Orwell. But I want to hold off on that for a second because <laughs> I want to talk about the mindset early on with Examine.com. Um, what was the vision early on when you first started it? So I have to be honest, I usually don't have a vision when I start yeah, something. I like the honesty. Yeah, go with it. Yeah. <laughs> Everything I've started has been always for me, uh, out of my own self-interest. Yeah. So I've been a digital nomad for five years. I come back to Toronto. I was significantly overweight. And as I started losing weight, I realized that these supplement companies were selling you garbage. Like there's a picture. I literally had 40 different that. supplements, yeah. right? So... As, as I got more curious about it and as I started looking into it, I wondered to myself, why is there no repository where I can look mm-hmm. up supplementation information, look up nutrition information, and not worry that someone's trying to sell me a cleanse or a detox or a juice for greens or whatever, right? What were you and trying that, that was not working at the time? Uh, just supplements in general. I... Uh, I was at this time, I, I wasn't really doing much, so I was just, my first thing was I just walked. I tried to walk 10,000 steps a day. Mm. And there's studies that have shown, and this was true for me, that once you institute one healthy habit, others will fall into place. You okay. will just naturally become more aware of what you're eating and what you're doing and stuff like that, right? Mm. So kind of going back to it, it was just, there's no information that I can trust. Why don't I make it ha- happen? And it was actually my two friends. I was in Colombia. They're both have PhDs. I was whining about this to them, and they yelled at me. They said, "Why don't you make it happen?" And I was like, "Damn, now I must." So that's where I picked up my co-founder on that, and we started going, and and that's kind of how we got into it. Yeah. So, examine.com. That's uh, yeah. Immediately when I thought, "Wow, that's a a premium domain." Yes. How was it acquiring examine.com? So right after my when I was in Colombia, I went to Panama, and there's quite a few domain guys in in Panama. And my approach to business has always been, or to starting up a website is, I invest at least a, a decent amount of money into a domain. Yeah. And my viewpoint on that is, so I spent 41000 to buy examine.com from someone in Panama. But my viewpoint was, even though it cost me 41000 right then, I could have turned around and sold it for thirty or 35000 within 24 hours. Yeah. So it wasn't a sunk cost of forty one that I could never get yeah. back. Right. It was more of an opportunity cost of 41000 instead mm-hmm. of a sunk cost. Yeah. So that's always been my viewpoint. I've always invested a decent amount in domain. Uh, my next project is Pet Science, which cost me 10000 My next one was sjo.com, which is what I'm working on right now. I saw that, that yeah. cost 24000 um, SJO did well. Yeah, I have a couple comments about SJO, which I wish I want to get to too. All right. Yeah, but yeah, I, I always believe in investing in domain because that's part of your brand, right? And you want to be easy for people to remember. And Examine.com, yeah. pretty easy. Very easy. So, what were you willing to spend? Like, obviously, you spent forty-one thousand. Did you say, okay, okay, I'm gonna spend up to what was your your limit? Uh, oh, for a domain name? Yeah, at that point, like, were you thinking, okay, I, think I want to spend less? I was willing to go up to fifty. I, I think, uh, in my viewpoint, I had a good idea. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Um, and I knew we would never sell supplements. I knew we were never going to sell any physical You knew product. that. Why did you yeah, know that? Yeah, off the bat. Yeah. There was no way in hell. Like if we did start selling supplements, and you, we've already lost the trust, right? Like if I'm telling you, oh, yeah, this works, by the way, buy our supplement, you right. go, come on, man. There's a, there's a massive conflict of interest. Yes. So we knew that, but I knew how much money you could make selling information because I'd done it before. Yes. So I was like, okay, you know what? I'm willing to give it a go. Again, if it fails, I'll have a nice domain. If not, well, here we are. Yeah, that is an important part of the story, which I didn't mention in the intro on purpose because I knew we'd get into it, but you are not affiliated with any supplement company. So right. there's no like bias there when you're doing the research. Yeah. Um, and we, don't do, we don't do consulting. We don't do donors. We don't do sponsors. We don't do advertisers. So no one 
can exert influence on us. It's yeah. just we're selling what we sell. You want to be a customer, awesome. Otherwise, that's yeah. all we have. So what else were you considering besides examine.com? Any other domains that were top of your list? Uh, diagnose and configure were the other two. Diagnose.com? Yeah, diagnose.com and configure.com. But examine.com just felt the most like we're examining science, we're examining the truth. Whereas configure would be like, you know, we're going to help configure your health or, or diagnose with diagnosing what the reality is. But examine just kind of flowed the best out of all. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, the first two years generated no revenue. Yeah. Tell me your mindset and what you're thinking after year one, uh, year right. two. Yeah. In that regard. So. When we first started, it was just, again, it was a project. We'll see how it goes. And I think it was about three or four months in when Dr. Oz mentioned raspberry ketones. And maybe we're getting maybe two, three, four hundred visitors a day. And then suddenly we got over 2,000. Mm. And that's because we were number four on Google for the key phrase raspberry ketones dosage. Not even the main word, right? Some random little side word. And that's instantly where we knew that we had something. Where if such an obscure search phrase was giving us so much traffic... Mm. People were hungry for information on, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And that was kind of, you know, that's kind of when we knew we were onto something. Now, in terms of before we decided to sell anything, it was a huge evolution, right? From yeah. if you use archive.org and look at where we were back then, right. where we were two years ago, where we are today, it was an evolution. And it was only two years in where we felt comfortable saying, okay, we know what we're talking about. Or, okay, you know, you can send average Joe to our website and we'll feel comfortable about that. It may be slightly overwhelmed. But they'll be, these guys are trustworthy, they're reliable, they know what they're talking about. And once you hit that level, then you, at least for me or my companies, then I feel comfortable saying, I'm ready for you to open up your wallets and I'm ready to, uh, to sell you something. So that was kind of, it wasn't a, a metric that we hit, it was just we are now comfortable with what we have. Yeah, and your partner, Curtis, has a yeah. deep background in nutrition. Right. Yeah, so you know he uh, he was like an amateur bodybuilder. He got a degree in dietetics, which is what registered dietitians get. And he was then getting his PhD in nutrition. When I said, "Listen, you know, you can do your PhD whenever you want." I mean, there's some curse words and expletives in there, but I said, "You can do your PhD whenever you want. Why don't you come join me and do something cool?" And I was part of this. Uh, I was so I, I've been a writer for a long time, but I was part of this fitness and health community. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't some random Joe coming out of nowhere saying, "Hey, come work with me." Yeah. Right, he knew who I was. He knew my reputation. He knew kind of the the personality I had and how it really kind of jived well with him. Yeah. And so he was pretty much on board immediately. Right, yeah. it made sense to him. Yeah, I mean, and, and yeah. And Go one on. of the things I said to him was, you know, because I've done this before, you focus only on the research and the content. I'll take care of everything else. Which to him was perfect. That's right? exactly what he wanted to do. Any hosting or development or anything like that. Yeah. He just focused on the research, and I focused on everything else. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask about. Where do you decide to start? Because there's so much out there. Yeah. W what do you? Where do you start? I I always love using Reddit to find people to work with. Um, Reddit for people who don't know is basically the world's largest message board. I think that's the easiest way to say it. And it's got a message board on any 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 topic you could imagine. Yeah. Uh, just to compare, like fitness, the fitness membership has seven million. Uh, visitors there or wow. users sorry subscribers um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of the the, the users there I am on his advisory board but that's just my yes. slight humble brag right there but so any topic you want so my next one is pets for example right so they have dogs they have animals they have pets they have cats they have um, pet sports or pet psychology stuff like that so I'm part of all these communities and I and I and I post and I comment so down the road what happens is I'll see who's commenting who's intelligent who who kind of has an even keel which is relatively tough to find on the internet at times. And then I'll be able to go to them and I say, hey, listen, this is who I am. You can see what I've done before. I would love to work on this project with you. You take care of the research. You take care of whatever the content mm -hmm. is. I'll take care of everything else. Yeah. And that's kind of now my, my way of making it happen and making it work. And Curtis is very involved in, in Reddit. Yeah, so Curtis was actually up for moderator of the year. Wow. That's how involved he was. Yeah. He actually lost out to a bunch of people instead of one person. They were like a collective. But yeah, he was very active on it. He was very well respected. Um, and, and obviously, he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. So you two you know, form the company. Yeah. Now, where do you start with what articles, what nutrition do you start um, you know, right. doing research on first. For sure. So I'm a big believer in starting in your niche, like nichiest of niches, mm. and then expanding on it. So originally we were just bodybuilding supplements. I see. Right? So we took creatine, beta alanine, whey protein, glutamine, stuff like that. Mm. And as we expanded, then we're like, all right, now we're going to get into general supplements, right? And it was only about a year ago that finally we started analyzing nutrition research. 
Mm. Right? So I, I totally believe in literally dominating yeah. your niche where no one else can think about anyone else. And yeah. then you kind of slightly edge into more and more general areas, but then you keep that breadth and depth that made you an authority in the first place. Yeah. Not only dominating, but that niche is obsessed and passionate about that stuff. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that's the nice thing, right? The more niche you get, the more enthusiastic people are about it, right? The more they really care about it. So that when you do go a bit more mainstream or become a little bit more broadbanded, um, those people are still in love with what you're doing and, they, and then they become your evangelist, right? Yeah. They become the one who spread the gospel. Yeah. So, so after the first two years, is there any point where you're like, you're just like, I'm going to ride this thing out no matter what? Or were there any points along the journey that you're like, you know, we're not doing any revenue yet. We're not getting as much traction as I want. For the people out there who may be in this exact situation sure. right now, I mean, maybe two years in, they're like, I'm just ready to pull the plug on this thing. Right, so, right. No, I, I can totally empathize. Yeah. So with Examine, it was a little bit of a cheating position because yeah. I was in the quasi-retired state, so I wasn't worrying about money. I wasn't worrying about revenue. But, you know, you're never getting enough You're trap. a competitive guy. You're, you know, you're worried about that even though you're not worried about it, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, you're pragmatic about it, right? So, yeah. for example, if we fast forward to today, we have Research Digest. Some of these reviewers are paid six, $700 an hour, right? So you, you do realize that you need money. But if you go back to two years, you know, I'll admit, and any, I personally believe that any entrepreneur who denies it is lying a little bit. There's always moments of doubt. There's always times where you go, this is exhausting. You always go, am I, am I in over my head? Is this too much? Will this yeah. ever work out? Yeah. But what always kind of kept us going was yes. feedback we got from people, right? Okay. So we were always like, we want to hear from you. And not just the feedback, but how much people tweeted about us, how much they – Facebook – Back then, you could see who was post. You could search on Facebook to see who was posting about what. Now they've kind of eliminated. But seeing random people sharing our stuff on Facebook yeah. and tweeting about it, or on Reddit even saying, "Oh, these guys are great," and not even knowing who we are just by you know this the spread of it, that kind of keeps you going, right? Yeah. Where you go think about your own behavior. How many other websites are you so effusive in praise about, or how many websites are you like you have to read about this on Twitter? Not that many, right? Yeah. So off those that, little wins kept you going too. What's that? Those little wins kept you going. Exactly, right? When you know that, that and little wins are, are literally what everything is, right? People will think that businesses come out of nowhere, you suddenly become hot. The last company I can remember that came out of nowhere was hotornot.com, where literally they exploded over 48 hours, right? But it is always the little wins that add up and add up and add yeah. up. Eventually, then yeah. suddenly, boom, you're getting 100,000 visitors a day and no one can ignore you anymore. Yeah. That's why I so, love including that in the intro because sure. when they hear that, it's like, well, you toiled for two years with zero revenue and that's the reality of things oh, you know, absolutely. most of the time. And what you guys do a good job, and I've heard you speak about this, is taking user feedback and, leave, and doing it in open-ended questions. Yes. You know, so tell me about some of the responses you got and how that shaped your verbiage on your website or, oh, yes. yeah. So I am obsessed with surveying our users. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, it's a relationship, right? And we are working on their behest. We are solving their problems or we're filling in a need or passion or whatever, right? Yeah. So I am obsessed with serving them at all stages. I survey them when, when they – if you first sign up for any of our email lists, first email you get is from Kamal saying, hey, a little bit of story about why we did this and, and what got us involved in this. If there's anything you want to know about or what's motivating you, just hit the reply, let me know. So we get maybe like 50 email responses a day. He can't respond to all of them, but we do read them all, right? So we yeah. survey them after they buy. We survey them after they've bought for a, a month or if they've been with us for a year or if they're even tweeting about us. We reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I just wanted to say thanks and wanted to know kind of what made you do this. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of how surveys made us who we are, at the end of the day, all three of our products have come out of surveys. We surveyed people. We said, hey, what do you want? They said, listen, you've got this amazing table of information. We wish you could take it somewhere. That was our first product. Did great. Afterwards, we surveyed them again. And they said, hey, listen, love your table, but it's too much for my mom and my dad. How about some step-by-step -step gu uh, guides or instructions on what to do? That was our second product. After that, we surveyed them again. They said, listen, we love this, but we really, and we really want to get into nitty-gritty. You know, you guys do great research. Why don't you get deeper into nutrition? That was our third product, right? So... Everything has evolved from what people are asking for. Yeah. And so when you mentioned verbiage, right, I'm a big believer that surveys will tell you what verbs to use right. to sell back to your audience. Yeah. They will yeah. tell you what they're responding to. Yeah. And so, for example, we always used to say, oh, we're the independent source. But we noticed that everyone was saying that they trusted us because we were the unbiased source. Mm. So we, we the word yeah. independent was stricken and instead came the word unbiased, yes. right? So yes. 
it's sir people who don't survey always boggle my mind your users are there they want to talk to you you just have to give them the opportunity yeah that's and, yeah yeah i love that and as you said open ended questions are key you do not want to to guide them right you don't want to lead them on anywhere yeah yeah i can tell that a lot of thought goes into that because you know the page with the guide is just a well written direct response long copy page yeah yeah, yeah. and and Right now, we're redoing our original page just because of new feedback we've gotten. But same thing, right? It's the we figure out what their problems are, we figure out what their pain points are, we figure out what questions they are, what's motivating them, so we can hit on that. We can hit on uh, what maybe makes them not want to buy, right? Because we mm -hmm. always ask, also, you know, uh, if you were about to not buy, or if there was one moment where you hesitated, why was that? Yeah. Right. So some say price. Some say we didn't know that there was a uh, lifetime updates or would it ship to us? So then we have to yeah. make it more obvious that it's lifetime updates, PDF stuff like that. Yeah. So absolutely on board the survey train. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about. So when I'm looking on, I see the cheat sheet. You know, to better health and a better body and better life. What right. things that and I know that you guys are mad scientist testers. Um, what things have worked with modifying that page and what things have not worked as far as that? Right. That page so. Goes? In terms of work, we found that the headline has done almost more than anything else. Mm. I mean, instead of just major revisions, right? Headline is what's going to suck people in and it's what's going to set the tone for what they're expecting. Yeah. Right? So people forget. And it's really important to write a headline in the context of how you're solving their problem. They don't care you're the greatest or that you're the best or the sexiest. Well, how does that impact their life? Yeah. But if I'm telling you, you know, this is cheat sheet to help your life, suddenly they're like, okay, now I'm interested. Right, or if you're saying, "Hey, maximize your your uh, the solution for yourself." Now they're interested. So I I always, or from what we found anyway, um, headlines have done the best for us. Yeah. Uh, we've done like free trials. We've done uh, you know sneak peeks. We've done shorter pages, longer pages, more testimonials, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We found as long as we're hitting their pain points and all that kind of stuff, it it's kind of it works out for itself. Mm -hmm. What's your process for creating a page like that? You know, is it you writing it and then you have a copywriter look over it or no, do you? No. So, yeah. yeah, great question actually. Uh, we survey our users. Uh, we give it to the copywriter. We tell them other like surveys from all different aspects of where we've been getting it from. And she kind of works on it herself. Um, we prefer to stay, we, well, we're obviously involved, but we don't want to get too involved in, in another way because we're too close to the ground. Right? Yeah. We know what the value is, we know what the proposition is, we know why it's amazing, but we need someone who's disengaged. So we never, ever, yeah. ever write the copy ourselves. Now, once she writes it, then we'll go over and we'll go like, hey, what about this? We don't say, why did you cover this? Because that was her job, looking through the right. questions. They're the expert, out. yeah. Right, but then we say, hey, what about covering this? Or maybe what about this? Or I think this is a great addition. And so it'll be more of a, an additive effect than us going, no, you need to cut this out or you need to cut this out. But that's... I'm a big believer in why would you hire an expert if you're not going to take their expertise seriously. Yeah. And so I let the expert be an expert. At what point do you decide, did you decide we need a professional copywriter and we can't oh, just do this internet? I think off I've never bat. been more stressed in my life than trying to write the copy for our first product because I, I always brought someone else, but I was like, okay, we're going to keep this self-contained. We're not going to let cost spiral out of control. But off the bat, I was just like, no, 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 no. This is worth the two, three, four, five, whatever thousand it cost me. And eventually our sales were like 150,000, right? So. Yeah. To me, it was a bit of personal debt for a moment, but that's fine. Right. It was literally, that has been the most stressful thing in my life was trying to write a sales page. Yeah. yeah. So, Saul, so walk us through the process a little bit from there. So, obviously, you survey them, you get it back, yeah. you put the page up, then what's yeah. your step for then you have to launch the, the actual product to the right. audience? Or the, go with the first one because at this point, you're like, you don't have revenue at this point. So, right. it's worth a little bit, it's, you know, more at this point. Yeah. So, how we broke it down was, was two ways. One, because we were because we don't do clients, all the trainers and RDs tend to love us because we're not trying to steal their business. So over two years, I had amassed maybe over a thousand people in contacts who had audiences of themselves. So I reached out to them one by one, and, and this was not automated. This was literally on Facebook one by one. I said, "Hey, what's up? What's going on? This is yeah. what we're up to. We're launching it. You know, I'd love to just even show it and get what your thoughts are." Yeah. And so I had this giant spreadsheet and it was laborious. Like it literally took me one week to message and email everybody right. on a case by because I looked up their Twitter first and their Facebook to see what they were up to if I hadn't talked to them for a while, right. see kind of what's going on in their lives. 
this was the grit and grind that everyone talks about. This was it, right? So I reached out yeah. to them. I showed them it. Most of them said, this is amazing. I said, hey, listen, we're going to launch on X date. I would love to have you on board. This is what our affiliate thing is. Most internet marketing and fitness is 75% or 80%. We said, listen, we're just doing 50-50 because that's who we are. We are our own thing. You know, Love your support and all that. We got a great response out of that, yeah. a fantastic response. And part of it was because I built up these relationships over years yeah. now that, yeah. and they knew who we were that they were like happy to support. The other thing then was we didn't do this the first time. We've learned so much more. But for our sale, we just had a little email list and we just blasted them. We said, hey, you know, this has come. Now we, we do pre-launches. We, we segment our list. It's a lot smarter. It, yeah. I think the return's a lot better. But for the email, we we're just like, boom, this is out. The one thing we also did that I find that most websites don't do is we put ads on our own website saying we have a launch going on or mm. one-time sale. Because even at that time, I think we we're at 10,000 visitors a day, yeah. you know, that generated a significant amount of traffic, right? People who weren't on our email list typing in examine.com or going to one of our pages and they say, hey, you know, sale until the end of the week. And again, we had that authority and that trust with them that they're like, right. okay, let's do this. So when we did launch, I mean, I had so many people in fitness and health message me. I even had my girlfriend's uh, friends message her saying, your, your boyfriend's website is everywhere on my Facebook feed. We had, I think, like 300 people share on the same day. So they could not get away from us. And so that was, I mean, that was its own social proof, right? It boosted the traffic for later right. on. But all that legwork, all of that setting it up, yeah. it generated a lot of return that way. How do you decide on price? I noticed it's, it's really not that expensive. I mean, it's $49 for one of them. Price, I expected yes. to scroll all the way down this this long sales letter and actually to be more expensive. Um, yeah. You know what? I got to be honest. You smile at that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows how to set price. That is the one thing I never, I do not believe in user surveys is asking them about price because yeah. people always understate how much they're willing to pay. So for our, our reference that you talk about, we started off with 29 and then we're like, yeah, it's sale till 39. Eventually, we just ended up at 49. Yeah. But for our next product, which was our stack guides, we actually did price test. So we had 16 guides. We Our full price at the time was uh, 49 for all of them. Mm -hmm. or one, oh, Sorry, 49 for one of them and 149 for all 16. Hmm. And so we price tested 79 versus 99 versus 119 right. as a sale price. And 119 actually won out. Hmm. And since then, that's influenced me and my team more towards higher price point than what you would imagine because you can always do a sale also, right? If, especially right. when you get into distribution. If we're going to register dietitians or training organizations and we, we're already a low price, then you know where's the exclusivity on a on a on a good break. Right. But right. if we're already our research digest is thirty dollars a month, if we say, hey, you know, you can sell for only twenty bucks a month, that's thirty three percent off, it's still a decent price for us, yeah. a solid price. Yeah. And they still feel like they're getting a huge um, sale. Yeah. That's kind of how we've made it work for us. Yeah. And you have a monthly talk about the monthly uh, subscription people can sign up for as well. Right. So again, it came off of surveys where people saying, Hey, you know, we want nutrition information, how can we get it? or nutrition research broken down. And that's kind of what we did, right? So we analyze eight uh, studies a month. It's $30 a month and it's two volumes per month. Yeah. It's not relatively cheap. That pricing it, table is, is genius. I, I want you to talk about it a little bit. The, the three the three prong pricing table. Well, it's, it's the same thing, right? Yes, like you yes. always want to anchor people towards a, a higher price so that you're, I mean, when you're going to the psychology of it, right? You always want to anchor towards a higher price so that other prices look don't look as intimidating. Right. Right, so when you look at our pricing, you see it's twenty nine ninety nine a month versus two ninety nine a year, which is just ten months, which is kind of like a standard thing to do, uh, versus a lifetime price, which is three times. Right, so right. even looking back, whenever you talk to people about churn rates and and lifetime values, getting someone to pay off for thirty six months up front is fantastic. Yeah. Right, because that's money in the bank today. Yeah. And so I had guys email me um, when we did the launch, and they're like, "Wow, you know, it was only six ninety nine or five ninety nine for lifetime. I bought it instantly. Yeah. I think it's too low." Yeah. And I said, listen, I understand what you're saying, but it's a simple like times 10 times 3. And for us, it's 600 bucks that we have today instead of waiting around three years to collect over you, right? right so right. that's why worthwhile. And also it boosts our revenue in the short term, which is good because, you know, it helps for like press and whatnot yeah. before long term, everything else kicks in long term. So that's kind of how we set that up. Um, it's interesting. We did a one year anniversary sale uh, just last month mm. and, and I posted on SJO.com about it. And we actually had more yearly sales than we had monthly sales. Mm, and really? yeah, and the average customer or the person who bought had been on our email list for over a year. 
right? So we showed that value. We, we I mean, we also made another ten thousand just off lifetime sales, right? Nineteen yeah. sales we made. Um, so anyway, that's how we broke down the price. And then our research digest, that's how it came about, right? Like where people yeah. want industry information. And now the nice thing about this research digest is we can get into the continuing education units. So that's where you kind of then become a little bit more strategic as you become more and more evolved, right? So to be a trainer, to be an RD, almost any uh, professional designation, you need what are called continuing education units right. to show you're still up to date. Right. So we've now been approved for a lot of the training ones. We're about that's to be great. Approved, right? So now Huge. that becomes another sales thing, right? Where you go, listen. As a registered dietitian, you need 75 hours every five years, right? Each issue of ours is four hours already. You subscribe for one year, you're already 66% of the way there, it's right? It's a no-brainer, yeah. Exactly, right? So then the value starts kicking in. So that's kind mm -hmm. of how we ended okay. up with that. All right. Well, I have someone to connect you with on that front too, actually. That's the thing about on the, the continuing education. I'll make a note of that. But, um, you know, there's one thing I want you to talk about too um, is – automation and systems because it goes into your overall arching goal which goes right. into life balance and work so right. talk about your philosophy with life balance and work and then we'll talk a little bit about how you automate because i like how you think uh, on trying to automate everything right so i always tell people that i'm living the immigrant dream which is you know i've come i came here when i was 14 yeah. um i am now living you know a very enjoyable life and I think part of it is because, uh, so two years ago, my sister got married, and uh, we had relatives in India and Pakistan who applied for a visa to come to the country, and they were denied by the government saying, we don't know if you'll go back to your home country. Mm -hmm. Now, notwithstanding the, the legitimacy or, or not of that They're argument. They're just cracking down on that stuff. Sure, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, I'm, and my, my overarching point on that is that, you know, I have cousins in Pakistan and India who are making $500 a, a, a month. Am I working harder than them? Absolutely not, right? Am I smarter than them? Uh, not even close. So to me and why I got into business was not to, was never to have like a, a nice car or a great watch or have expensive tastes. It was more about, you know, freedom for me to be able to do whatever I want, right? right? Freedom to be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. So a lot of people I find, you know, they almost live to work, whereas really you want to work to live, right? Mm -hmm. So. To me, I try to work maybe four or five hours a day, which does not sound like a lot, but if you actually spend focus four to five hours a day, it is actually a lot of effort, a lot of work. And I do it four days a week. Fridays to me are reading days. If you were to send me an interesting article to read, I'll save it for Friday, I'll go to the coffee shop, I'll sit there almost all day, I'll read, I'll have people come and visit me and we'll hang out for an hour or two and then they'll bounce while I just sit there. So that is like my overarching goal is, how can I make my life simple enough right. that, so I also try to travel at least 90 days a year. I'm at, I think, 80 days for this year. So how can I make my life easy that I don't have to stress out, I can have my beautiful head of, head of hair, I don't have to- Are you rubbing it in? The, no, I'm, to, to, to me? I'm, I'm hoping my brother watches this who was balding like 10 years before my current <laughs> age. But, um, you know, how can I find this nice balance where I don't, you know, people are always on online or on Twitter or on Facebook where I don't need any of that. And I think part of that is, again, the immigrant mindset, right? Where yeah. just being able to say, I've got a nice place where I live in and comfortable, I'm already ahead of 99% yeah. of people that were back there, right? Yeah. So Yeah, I mean, you, you have a certain amount of gratitude and appreciation. Paint the picture for people who didn't experience that. What was life like <laughs> in, it was in Pakistan, right? You grew up in Pakistan? Right, so I, I'm ethnically yeah. Kashmiri. I was born in Pakistan, grew up yeah. in Southern Asia. So, yeah. um, so we used to spend all of our summers in Pakistan. So that was like three months, like literally... Last day of school, next day, pack our bags, we're going to Pakistan. The day right before school started, we're okay, we're arriving back in the country. The thing I remember the most is in the summer months, monsoon season would hit and the sewers would overflow. So literally, mm. the entire city, country, whatever, would smell like excrement. Like, can you imagine? And it's not like they were being duplicitous about it or it was evil. It was just the infrastructure could It's just happen. what happens. Yeah. It, it did not happen. Uh, I had no shower, right? So you basically fill up a giant bucket with water. You take a little bucket, you splash it on your head. There'd be a drain in the middle of the bathroom. It's just the toilet, the, the sink, and the drain in the middle. And you'd soap yourself up and you do it. And inevitably, and, and this is why I have a phobia of drains, is after I would five too or six buckets, that. when you're completely sopping wet and you're half soapy, cockroaches would come flying out of the, out of really? the damn drain. And of course, the drain never had any covers on it because that's just how it was. And no matter how much water you put before the shower to try to flush out the cockroaches, they would always wait until you're naked, in sandals, half wet, <laughs> can't see anything, what's going on, and suddenly the cockroaches come out. Right? Oh, or you put in your pants. I, I, I had a time where I put on my pants, there's a cockroach in there. I put my, my foot in a shoe, there's a cockroach there. And, and it's not like 
we were poor, like relatively my family was, was, uh, off, was very well off there. Right. But that's just what the situation was, yeah. right? So when you come here and you're like, okay, you know, I could get a, a $100,000 car or I could just work less. And, you know, like I was telling you earlier, my, one of my favorite things to do is go for an hour long walk with my dog. You know, I go with him, I sit in the park, he runs around, I read my book or I chat some humans nearby. Done, right? To me, that's a much more fulfilling life. Now, I'm not saying don't go for 10 million or 100 million or whatever motivates you awesome. But for me, being yeah. able to enjoy life, being able to take courses and class, like I just took a, a, a ceramic uh, up, uh, what's it called? pottery uh, throwing class, right? Clay throwing class, you know, like ghost with the wheel and everything, yeah. <laughs> right? But if you're always working, you don't have time. It's a four hour class, yeah. right? Then you feel guilty, like, oh my God, I'm taking four hours out of the day plus the 30 minutes to get there and back, five hours out of my day to take this class. I feel guilty because I should be working. So yeah. I think that's what's really important is once you're at a comfortable level, yeah. You know, maybe it's time to look at other things that are more fulfilling than just generating more revenue. Yeah. So, so what did yeah. you want to be when you grew up? So. Oh, I wanted to be a scientist originally. That was my thing, um, which is maybe I'm attracted to to science. Examine.com. So I mean, pretty much. Yeah. And after that, I just wanted to be independent. So I tell my people, uh, or I tell people, my father is a very, very brilliant mechanical engineer. Mm. But because he joined the Saudi uh, petrochemical company as a Pakistani citizen, yeah. they would never promote him past manager. If he had joined as a Western citizen, they would have made him general manager. And really? if he was an Arab, he would have become president. Now, his superiors took care of him really well. Like he lived a really good life from that. But he could never get higher, mm. right? So, so going back to it, my biggest thing was just freedom. Right? I yeah. never wanted to work for anybody else. I was never going to work for the man. I still remember mouthing off to my teachers in high school saying they would work when they work for me, which is, of course, ridiculous because if you don't like them, why would you want people you don't like working for you? But that's a whole different aside. It was just I wanted to find a way to be independent, um, which then goes into my name change and all that too, right? How yes. I can just be me without having um, other people dictating what life or what I can do. Yeah. There's too many questions based off that. I mean, one, I want, I want to get into uh, your first entrepreneurial experience, but I want to talk about the automation. But let's, right. I want, th this kind of segues into, you didn't start off as Saul Orwell. So, wh right. so who, who are you? Because you don't even have a what? You don't even have a birth. Uh... Yeah, so my birth certificate is lost. It, it, it was required for my, when we immigrated here, but my parents don't know where it is. Um, they, the hospital I was born in no longer exists. So there's no like, physical papers to go get. Uh, the name change was, was, was organic in the context that I didn't get to choose my name. And like I said, I'm fiercely independent. And my last name was my dad's first name. Yeah. And his last name was his dad's first names, right? So it wasn't like I had any lineage to keep or to trace. Yeah. In fact, my father had to legally change his name when we came to Canada because they got so confused. Where they would say, why does your wife and your kids have your first name as your last name? And, and they didn't understand, right? Because right. It doesn't exist as a concept here. So to me, name change was just, you know, I didn't get to choose my name. And I, and I believe that name impacts were kind of, I think it was in Freakonomics where they discussed the name and what an impact yes. it has on your career. And yes, whatnot, it does. Right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So it was always fascinating to me. So for about a year, I would go to a party or an event and I would just try on a new name. I'd be like, hey, I'm Hank or hey, I'm this or hey, I'm whatever. <laughs> and, and Saul just fit the best. You know, people always ask like, where did you come with Saul? And you know it's it's memorable. You met like an old Saul. Jewish grandpa, or yeah. No, it's uh, actually the original idea of Saul is from Saul Campbell, who was a soccer player in the uh, on the British national team, and he was a very no nonsense player. And I used to play soccer, and I used to be actually MVP of my league, and I was oh, nice. also a very no nonsense player. But that's where I originally got the the idea of Saul from. And then, uh, so yeah, so eventually Saul went out and number two was Logan, which is the real name of Wolverine. And so he's short, he's hairy, he's Canadian, he's the best <laughs> at what he does. And I decided that totally resounded with me. But Saul just rolls off the tongue so nicely that I ended up becoming Saul. So, and it's been like six years now. So, so what is your original name? Or is We're that... going to leave that to the, the annals of time. You have to like I look, you have to do your it. research to find that. I actually don't hide it. But every time someone asks me, I always like playing coy. Because That's cool. That's just it's like a magic trick. Yeah. It's like, I don't even want to know, <laughs> you know? <Exactly>. Uh, <laughs> so talk about the systems, automation that you put into the business that allows you to have that balance and take the pottery class. Right. So 
the uniqueness of what I do or all my business to do is usually in my co-founder or someone else, right? So there was Curtis. Now there's Kamal, who is the editor of the website, who's the editor-in-chief of our research digest and whatnot. So they are in, in a lot of ways a lot more valuable than I am, right? It's harder to replace them. Like Kamal has a, a master's in business administration. He also has a master's in public health. And he was doing his PhD in nutrition. So he's got this nice yeah. breadth and depth of understanding. So yeah. that's you could things. go in and change the code and the site goes down. So I, I wouldn't say that you're, uh, you're not valuable. So right. Yeah. So originally that was true. Yeah. But the way I, I view myself is I'm a bunch of cogs. Right. So while Curtis and Kamal are doing the research and the actual work and, and all that, you know, I am HR. I am customer support. I am web development. I am, let's say, marketing and all that kind of stuff. So if you take a step back and you look at all the things you're doing and you see them all as cogs, you go, OK, how can I bring in a nicer gold plated cog instead of my current bronze plated who will be doing much better than than what I am doing right. at this at the specific job. Yeah. Right. So for web development, we brought in a, a developer. Right. And then he brought in a, or we brought in then a junior developer with him. Right. Yeah. So for customer support, we brought in a, um, and a lot of the internal works, we brought in an operations manager. Mm -hmm. Right. So she's based in Toronto. She's got that personality where she's a little bit bubbly. Yeah. She's very energetic. She's organized. She likes getting things done. Right. So yeah. she took over that. So she took over customer service. So that's pretty much how I've always operated my businesses is how can I bring in people who can do what I'm doing, the, the specific parts of what I'm doing, but can do it better than I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in people in paying people more than I pay myself. Right. I believe like if these guys are the ones who are really making things work, I don't need to pay myself so much because they're doing the hard work. I'm like, sure, I funded it and I founded it, but you can call me even a socialist, but I feel like they're doing the hard work now, so they're going to get rewarded. Now, right. at the same time, I always retain ownership of my companies. So if we ever were to sell or whatever, sure, I'd get a bigger bulk. But on the day-to-day, -day, when they're generating the cash flow from their hard work, yeah. I, I fully believe they, they earn it and they, they yeah. deserve it. And then any extra bonuses... You know, I always also believe in big bonuses because they're doing great works if we, if we have enough money to be giving out bonuses. Yeah. So that's kind of my mindset. Yeah. So, so on that point, you know, in the beginning, you are doing a lot of uh, the work and a lot of different jobs. At what point do you decide to hire out? At what point is the right time do you think that people should do it? Um, I'm a big believer in positive cash flow. Um, so yes, me too. <laughs> huge believer, <laughs> yeah. right? So. We, we did our, let's say, our first sale. We made about 150000 right? So that's when I brought in, in Kamala and a few other people, editors, to really make the content good. So about a year after that, we did our stack guys, which brought in, I think, four or $500,000, right? So at this time, we'd already built in, ca we already had cash, we already had cash flow. So at this point, it's like, okay, seeing how we're growing, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk, maybe take a minus 5K a month kind of risk, but it will make us more robust. We'll be able to grow in this, we'll be able to grow in this, we'll be able to grow in this, which is what's happened, right? We're now at over 40,000 visitors a day. You know, we're in mainstream everywhere. You almost cannot escape from us. So the decision to me is, you know, do we have enough revenue? Can I cut back on myself? You know, maybe let's say I was paying myself 5,000 a month. Can I come out and cut myself back to 2,000 a month to be able to afford that extra 3,000 to bring somebody else in, yeah. right? And then they will grow the business more than I will being stuck at just 5K and not being right. able to expand as much. Yeah. That's kind of my mindset. Yeah. So what are the different positions that you have in place that has replaced you so far? So, right. So we've got um, uh, one guy. Uh, so Carolyn, who's the op, she met. So what's actually happened is they've got interns and other people underneath her. So I'm not that day to day. But Carolyn, basically, who's our operations manager, she's replaced all the customer service, all of the HR, all that kind of stuff. So under her, she's got a she's got a VA, she's got copywriters under her. If we have to do a blog post, she she assigns it all. So part of her job description has expanded before what I did, right? So when we did blog posts, I tell Curtis, we should talk about this. You used to write it, boom, we're done, right? We'd have these ty typos. It'd be just embarrassing all around. But now she's got two or three copywriters underneath her. She's got graphics people that she pulls in to do uh, graphics work and all that. So my main jobs were, were basically customer service, um, outreach, and uh, I guess. I guess those were my two, and development, sorry, those are the three main ones, right? But as people have come in, even the definition of that role has expanded, mm -hmm. right? Development is not just developing the website, but now looking into, okay, how can we make an API to eventually do a, to an app? Or how can we do JavaScript that people can put on their website so it'll automatically link uh, subliminal yeah. words to us, right? So outreach, same thing, right? How can we now do uh, Facebook advertising or if someone's visited our Facebook page and is not on our email list, how, we can, get, how can we reach out to them? So those those I had those roles, but they are now much more expansive than when I was just the one doing them. Mm -hmm. What other what software do you use behind the scenes that people don't see that helps you automate some of the oh, business? We use so stuff? many. So 
there's a there's a company called Segment, and what Segment does is instead of having to copy paste JavaScript continually onto your own website, you do it through them. They kind of manage it for you. So Segment is is the let's say the engine right that runs it all. So behind that, we've got like we use Qualaroo for surveying. We use Mixpanel to track where what our visitors are doing. Um, I'm blank. There's like literally 20, 30 of them. We we spend. I think like 2000 a month just on SaaS products to make our life easier. There's CDNs, which are content distribution networks, so that our images are distributed so they load faster. Right. Um, there's a PDF generator we use for our reference guide. Um, email related? What about setting? Yeah, so, all right, email, perfect. So email, we use MailChimp for our ma- uh, general mailing list. We use Entreport for uh, segmenting and, and doing sequences. We use my own audience owl, which I did originally build for my own needs, which right. is, again, all my businesses, yeah. which basically analyzes people's emails to figure out who they are. So it calculates their Facebook, their LinkedIn, their Twitter, their bio, their picture. So then we can, when we do outreach or if we find that there are specific users and that our customers are on our email list, we can reach out to them. Yeah. So stuff like that, I mean, yeah. Part of the pain was... That time when you spent like a week just emailing people individually, right? So, yeah. what so, made you create Audience Owl? Yeah. So, Audience Owl was it was it was actually a separate pain. Was you know we all know that our email list is the most valuable thing we have, right? It's more valuable than our Facebook fans or, or our Twitter followers. But here's all these emails, and we have no idea who the hell is behind them, right? So, if I sign up for your email list and I'm solidexamine.com, you even go to the about page of examine.com, I'm the seventh person listed, right? Like, oh, who's this tool moving on? So, it really <laughs> I would never that say that. <laughs> <laughs> we had no way of figuring out who was behind it. So I wrote a simple software that was basically analyzing these emails and figuring out what their Facebook and Twitter was. And our first, uh, so some guy named Ed Vanstone at AMI Media or something, he signed up, right? Okay. And if you look at the email, you're like, whatever. But his linked, or sorry, his Twitter profile said he's the editor-in-chief of Men's Health Dakota UK. So I reached out to him. I said, hey, Ed, I saw you, you signed up. If I can ever help you with anything, just let me know. So three months later, we were on their website, and three months later, we were after that, we were in their magazine. Yeah. And you know everything about like magazines, right? Once you're in one, it's so much more easier to be in, in, in all the others. Right. So it was just th- this kind of proactive outreach um, that I was always I always recommend for entrepreneurs is you know be proactive about this kind of stuff. Yeah. This proactive outreach is what got us into yeah. all these magazines we're in now. So that's that's why we built Audience Owls. You know, if people are signing up, or if you're getting customers, and you don't know anything about them, like you are already way behind everyone else. Right? Instead of manually typing in someone's email or, or, or typing in Jeremy W or, you know, where, what am I going to end up with, whatever, boom, instantly, you know, you know who this person is. Right. And then you can yeah. reach out to them or, or you can be, um, what's his name? Uh, Joel had a great, or Joey had a great uh, talk on, um, for Mastermind Talks by Jason Gagnard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he had a great talk Joey on Coleman. 100 years after. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And he talked to, yeah, that's right, Joe Coleman. He was talking about, you know, what about the cycle after 100 days after someone's a customer? And he, you know, he pulled up all these pictures and all that kind of stuff. And so that's what, what I was trying to automate was still you have to put in the human touch of reaching out to them and figuring out what's of interest and what's not. But at least we put all that information for you in one place so you have a starting place to, to make it mm-hmm, all happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the staff's huge, the systems and automation, the software. The other part right. that you really are focused on and the site does well is the content piece. You know, the yeah. content is huge. Talk about a little bit about the process of creating just stellar content because I think it's valuable for everyone. I think um, I was actually talking to a friend about this earlier today. I think a lot of people are too busy generating content without thinking, is this good content or is this useful content? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was actually talking about as an easy example on SJO.com. I recently wrote about segmenting emails and I spent a lot of time researching about it to write about it. And I'm next one going to be talking about readability. And my thought process was I spent so much time in it so that when other people read it, they understood why it was valuable. Right? So since then, it gets tweeted still like two to five, ten times a day right? Yeah. because it's good content. So going back to exam, it was the same thing right? where we were like, all right, we can't just throw out anything. We need to do our research. And yeah. considering where we started and where we are today, so now you know, let's say Curtis is the primary on some subject matter. He'll write it out. He'll do the research. He'll, he'll have the uh, references and, and he'll put it out. This will then go to an edited, editing team, which is diverse, yeah. which is very I important. love hearing about this. Keep going. Yeah. This so is we, great. Have a, we have a PharmD who is a doctorate in pharmacy. We've got a biomedical PhD. And then we've got like pharmacy interns and other research interns and masters and all that. Or they're even working part time for us who get all this information, right? So then everyone just kind of goes in and cuts each other apart. But they do it in a way that scientific research is done, right? They go, yeah. hey, what about this? Or hey, what about this study? Or what about that, right? So then yeah. suddenly you have eight people throwing us suggestions and ideas. And it's really important that for the lead not have an ego to say, hey, you know, I did this research. Why are you, why are you tearing this apart? Right. And, I, and I, I don't know if I was lucky or if it was just the diligence that I mentioned about Curtis being even keeled. But if people come back to him and say, hey, what about this study? What about that study? He's like, okay. 
Or even mm. if the ph- pharmacist goes, hey, you know, what about this drug-drug interaction you forgot to mention or you maybe you didn't know about? He goes, okay. Yeah. Right? So now all this information comes back to him. He looks it over. He recollates it. He puts it all back into it. And it goes out to the team again. They look at it and they're like, okay, it's good. So now then it goes to our scientific copywriters who are like, okay, how can we make sure the essence stays the same, but also make sure that all the language is correct, all the grammar is correct, all the spelling is correct. Right. And then finally it goes to Kamal, who then just kind of gives, gives it a look because you know he is like, let's say it's his name at the end of the day. So he looks over and says, okay, you know what? This makes sense. Boom, it's live. Now what's actually happening is this is happening continuously. Yeah. So we have to do a better job about this ourselves. Like, you know, every day there's maybe two or three updates. People don't realize it's happening. So we need to do a better job. And this is like our next iteration is where people can follow a supplement page. And every time there's a new update or an update that we've or a change that we've done, it'll have a note about what the change was or what, what's been updated from mm. uh, previous to now. Yeah. So that people really know, wow, there's always stuff going on. Like we'll do a blog post maybe once a month on a new topic, but there's always little updates going on constantly yeah. in the system. Yeah, so that's so robust. Things. How do you manage all the writers? Do they use uh, one like Google document or what, what are people working on together? So what we usually do is we actually have our own internal system we've written that's similar to Wikipedia. It stores every revision. Mm. It lets you edit sections and whatnot. So basically the lead will send out an email saying this is what I've done. This is what I've updated. See. Um, we've thought about automating it, but it was almost overwhelming because too much systems. It was just easier for someone to pop out an email, wait a few days for the editors yeah. to, you know, set like a reminder of 72 hours or a boomerang, 72 hours later, come back to it and be like, okay, this is what I've done now. People look over, over, he sends it to the copyright or he sends it to Carolyn, operations manager, and now she takes over, right? Now yeah. she's like, okay, I'm in charge. I'm sending this to the to copywriter. The copywriter says, okay, she's like, okay, I'm sending this to Kamal. Kamal sends this, okay, done. Yeah. Right, so that's kind of uh, yeah. how it, how it all works out. So, what are what have been some of the most popular posts? So, popular posts tend to be mo- mostly myth busting. You know, for example, we talk about eggs are not as bad as people. I say. read that today. Yeah, that's right. A good one, or yeah. or MSG is actually nowhere near as bad as people think it is. Some people right. are allergic, but hey, that doesn't mean penis are bad because people are allergic to penis. And almost all of the studies that did show bad reactions to MSG, first of all, it was in like a hundred times doses that normally anyone would take, and it was directly injected into the uh, brains of rats. Right. So again, this goes back into how research gets manipulated or misrepresented so easily. Sure. So this was us doing it. Right. We went back and we're like, okay, this is what's really going on. So usually it's anytime we uh, bust a myth or we go, hey, this is what people think. Actually, our most, to be honest, our most popular topics is anytime a scientific study comes out that's buzzing is usually being misrepresented. Mm. And then we go in and we break it down. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the most popular one we had was about a year or two years ago. Uh, The study said that, um, high meat consumption is as bad as three packs of cigarettes a day. And I think it generated 200,000 visitors for us just for that one article. And I mean, the reality was they only looked at people above the age of 50. It wasn't a controlled study. They looked at and, people who already smoking three packs of cigarettes. Yeah, and, and, it was only, and, and, and the best part was yeah. they only split into two groups. And the, and the group that was 65 and older, they actually did better with more protein. So it was just a complete misrepresentation of yeah. what the re- – and, and what always bugs us is you know what the research actually is usually very interesting. Because research builds on other research to, to beget more research, right? right. But the media – and I'm not one to say, oh, the media is evil. But the media has a job of generating page views, right? They mm-hmm. are paid in traffic. Right. So it is no surprise that they will misrepresent things because then people will lose their shit, right? They'll go, oh, my God, fish oil causes prostate cancer, which is literally not what the study <laughs> found, right? Or, oh, my God, meat is the worst thing in the world. Or, oh, one study will say eggs are great. The next study says eggs are the worst thing in the world. So, yeah. That's, that's what gets most popular because then people are like, yeah, these guys are the unbiased yeah. um, and trustworthy source and now they're breaking it down. Is there one article that surprised you the most? Like you went in thinking your hypothesis was one thing and it came, came back completely different? MSG. I legitimately thought MSG was bad. But after we broke down all the studies and we found out that MSG was not bad at all, that it, it's just umami flavor, right? Which is arguably the fifth uh, sensation or taste on your, on your taste buds. Uh-huh. But after reading about it, um, now I'm very pro MSG. Anytime I see a Chinese restaurant that says they don't have MSG, I'm like, Psh, I'm not going to this place. It's a I'm, not my, I'm not getting my maximum flavor. Why would I do this to myself? <laughs> All of that MSG, please. So your first entrepreneurial venture. Yes. Yeah. What so, was that? Um, well, my first website was a, a programming website, which is just how I learned how to you know, HTML, right. uh, put together HTML and whatnot. But my first real website was a, a games website. Yeah. And uh, I remember it wasn't making much money. He just had some ads. It was almost like break even, but it was interesting. And I had a guy come to me. He said, and this was for uh, this was a website on online games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft. Right. 
And he came to me and said, listen, you know, I'll pay you, uh, I think it was 150 bucks a month for an ad. I was like, oh, 150 bucks a month in pure profit. I thought I was, like, I wasn't still in high school, right? I was like, oh, man, I'm so rich now. And then he came back and I said, sure. So he paid me and he said, hey, listen, uh, I, you know what I'll do is I'll even give you 10% of any sales you make. And I thought I was doomed, right? Because I tried um, a CPA, right? I tried doing co uh, cost per acquisition or, uh, or affiliate stuff and it always right. failed. I'm like, oh, there goes all my money, right? He's going to realize I'm done. But within the month, he made 3000 in sales, so I made an additional $300. Wow. Right, so I went from making you know a couple of dollars or whatever, breaking even, to now suddenly making five hundred dollars a month. I was yeah. like, "Whoa, what just happened?" And it was that kind of was my big break where I also realized how powerful content can be in generating sales if you I don't I don't massage the message right, or if you angle it right, or if you say you know here's the content, here's the usefulness. By the way, here's the call to action. Here's a problem you may have, and I'm going to solve this problem for you. Right. You know, buy my product or whatever. Yeah. So off the bat, I've only ever made money from uh, digital products. But it was that one little push, accidental ad um, by this one guy that kind of got me started along the way of how content can be used yeah. to make so much money through ads and then even through your own products or through other people's products too. Yeah. So Sal, when I was doing research, um, the phrase harvested gold kept coming up. Harvested gold? Gold. So uh, <laughs> in the online gaming sphere, the it, basically how this works or, or what happens is you're a busy right. professional. You don't have time to spend 10 hours a day. But you want the sort of doom which requires 10 hours a day. And here's, well, here's Joe, let's say, on the side. He's a student. He's got 15 hours a day. All he does is play. He's got 10 sorts of dooms. So I go to him. I say, hey, Joe, I will buy your sort of doom for 10 bucks. Joe goes, wow, you know, that 10 bucks is now paying for my online gaming uh, habit, right? 10 bucks a month, done. He sells it to me for 10 bucks a month. I go to you and I go like, okay, you know what? I know you're going to need 40 hours to, to, to get this sort of doom. I know you don't have the time, but I know you're a professional. I'll sell it to you for $200. You go, yeah, you know what? I could spend 40 hours or just 200 bucks. I could just get the sort of doom. You go, sure. That was, so that was, so that was what we were doing. We were selling items and we we're harvesting gold and what, or virtual currency, whatever, you know, some call it platinum, some call it ruble, gold, whatever. So that's what we were, were. we were middlemen though. We never did it ourselves. Right. Um, we just facilitated transactions. Yeah. No inventory ever. Yeah. I love that. And you built up some very popular directory sites. Yeah, so I mean, along the way, uh, I mean, and directory can be ambiguous, right? So I've done local search, local directories. I've also built uh, websites on on topics for different directories. Like I did one on uh, like a, a programming. I came back to it. We did one on um, scripts. Whew, it's been like over a decade. We did. We had very popular blog directories. We had one for CSS design, which was the original one called CSS Vault. If anyone's listening to this, has been around the internet for a while, they'll remember CSS Vault, and that was mine. Um, and so yeah, you know, it was just. I always did these things out of my self-interest because I was into CSS design, right? I was into um, local search. I was into all these other things. Yeah. And you just kind of see where they go. And some of them were just absolute failures. Yeah. Where I think the most I lost on one business was like 300000 That was just a debacle. What, but then, you know, other happened? ones What are, was that one? Uh, to be honest, I was just too hands-off. I mean, at the end of the day, a business still requires you. St I'm still considered the chairman of exam.com, right? I don't have to be involved in day-to-day. But on a month-to-month -month basis, I still have to check in to make sure everything's running. And so for this one, I just kind of totally dropped the ball. And I'd worked with this guy for a year, and I thought he'd run it well and whatever. And it was just a complete and utter, utter disaster. Like he was pulling up expenses. And I'm not, and he, I'm not saying he defrauded me in any way. No, he was just completely inept. Mm -hmm. And I did not oversee his ineptitude. And uh, so, yeah, you know, bought as that totally did not do anything for us. He was paid uh, decently. He spent money on projects that had literally – no reason to exist or had no cause for us to uh, to be involved in. Um, and so, yeah, it was just money down the drain before eventually, I think like 10 months in, I was just like, whoa, what's going on here? So, yeah. So what was your first big win? Um, my first big win was back going onto my online gaming website, just realizing what was going on. And then I expanded, right? I built content websites. I did this, I did this. And, um, you know, it. Uh, this is back when Google SEO was also brand new. Google was hot, but SEO was brand new. So this is like 2000, 2001, yeah. when all you have to do was buy a link on one pay, PR8 website and you go right to the top. So we dominated all, like, you know, so EverQuest at that, this is before World of Warcraft, right, which came out in 2003. EverQuest was the hot one at that time, and EverQuest Platinum was a currency. So we bought EverQuestPlatinum.com.net. We built websites on it. We were number one, two, three, four, five, whatever for the word EverQuest Platinum. And I think we were eventually like number four for the word EverQuest itself. Um, so yeah, you know, it was just this opened it up and then online games were, it, to be honest, even today, 15 years after the fact, online games was still the most money I've ever made 
in my life. <laughs> what by far still? What can someone make with online games at that time? It was just virtual currency, right? We were just uh, facilitating. So uh, let's say you're a hardcore uh, EverQuest player. Yeah. And so we had a website, and, and so there's classes and mages and whatever, right? Yeah. So let's say we had a website on EverQuest Druid. So you were interested because you're like, okay, I want to know what all the, the Druid spells are and what all the, I don't know. I, I was not even that involved in these games myself at this time. I barely played any of them. Um, you know, what the uh, clothes are that they wear, what the best sword is that I can buy. And so we like, here's an inventory. And it was all legitimate, very great content. It was the best in class content. You know, here's the best sword. By the way, do you want to buy the sword? Buy it from this guy hmm. who, was a, who was like a client or whatever ours, right? right? So then you'd buy and we'd get our nice uh, commission. And, and the, other, the other way we made a lot of money was through guides, right? Let's say, again, you've heard of World of Warcraft. It sounds amazing. You end up on this website and you're like, I don't know what the hell to do. And we're like, hey, you know, are you a World of Warcraft druid? You know, here's our $50 guide on on the first 10 levels because you level right? right on the first 10 levels of being a druid you're like sweet and then you're in right and then so that's that's yeah literally the most money we made wow <laughs> so what how old were you at the time um this is i was like uh, 19 so this, was, did this, this allow you to quasi retire was it the time or was it later on yeah, so by the time I graduated from university, uh, I was uh, the first student in the history of the University of Toronto, 170 years to create a scholarship while still a student. And then right mm -hmm. after I graduated, I basically gave it up to my number two. And yeah, I lived in the States, so I lived in South America. I was back in the States again. This was all around five years. And you know, I started up new projects, but again, this was basically me uh, spending more time, uh, to be honest, dicking around than, than doing anything. <laughs> Right, just and and I'll be honest. Even in this digital nomad, like I am more productive in my life, both on a personal and professional level, than I'm today. At that stage of my life, yeah. I was basically just being a bum. Like I was just traveling. I was enjoying myself, and and I'm not denying that at good times. But I was just kind of being a bum. I was yeah. almost uh, there was wanderlust, but wandering was not you know satiating yeah. uh, it at all. Yeah. So Sal, since it's inspired insider, I always ask, what's been the lowest point? And then how you push through it. So I had a, a business partner defraud me for many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. And uh, it, uh, yeah, it, 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 was, it was bad. It was we'd worked together for like three or four years. But he hit me in a spot where um, I wasn't in, uh, I was in Argentina, I think, when this happened. No, sorry, I was in, in Texas uh, when this happened. And I didn't have a chance to, like I was kind of isolated. I couldn't go to the bank. I couldn't make it happen. So I actually had to take a, a loan shark loan. Uh, out of that funness and um, oh, yeah. and uh, I do remember going to the grocery store and whatnot and buying things and you know when you put in your pen and you wait for the approved or denied um, I was always on the cusp of being denied like my yeah. credit cards were maxed out I got lucky almost that I got this extra credit card that the bank gave me for whatever reason but I'll take it um, and that extra 5000 off the credit card kind of got me through and even today now that you know my credit card balance are all in the zero, and you know I've got X num a massive amount of, of credit available, um, even today after I put in the pin, just out of that that tumultuous three six months it comes back to you. Even, I'm always like, okay, is it approved? Is it approved? Yet? I'm always like staring it down, even though again I've got more than enough cash in my wallet, whatever. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was rough. That was tiring. I even thought about getting a real job. But the idea of getting a real job was just to just the opposite of palpable, so I could never make that happen. How Sorry. did you pay the loan shark back? I always picture well, I someone thinking, like they're gonna come at you with like a baseball bat or something. I don't. I know, right? But um, so it was a fifty percent loan. It was fifty percent interest. I ended up paying wow. one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars on a hundred thousand oh dollar initial. Oh my god! Price. But it was just one of those. I had to do it. Uh, my websites and my domains and all my assets, my digital product was basically used as a collateral. Um, but yeah, you know, I had to do, I was still bringing in revenue. It's not like he stole all my revenue. He stole yeah. revenue that was owed to me. That was, you know, a, a chunk of change, obviously. Right. I think yeah. it was like 350,000 actually. Jeez. Um, so I had expenses to pay, right. That was off the bat. And I couldn't, like, I didn't have that much money sitting around in my bank account. Right. He had always paid me and he'd been a bit late. So I just assumed he would be, he yeah. paid, it'd be fine. Um, so yeah, I still had revenue and I yeah. had to skip more than I, I mean, again, it's maybe it's a good thing I yeah. had a very minimalistic lifestyle, but I had to skimp a little bit um, and yeah, just slowly, slowly wean it off. So Saul, it doesn't sound at all like you have bad blood towards a person, like you've forgiven them. 
for it. No, I, I have a. I, <laughs> I should not admit this publicly. Uh, I wouldn't say I've forgiven them, but yeah. I don't think about them. I think that's yeah. it's, it's happened in the past. You know, eventually I went to a lawyer and he was like, by the time, especially because you're a Canadian business, he's an American business, by yeah. the time this goes through years, you know, you'll maybe get 20000 yeah. But if you lose, you'll lose much more than 20000 yeah. or 50000 whatever it was. Yeah. And you're just like, well. I say shit. that because some people just focus in on that and they let it consume them. And you seem to be at peace with it. So I'm wondering how you got to that place. Uh, I, I honestly don't even have an answer for that. Yeah. I mean. Uh, we can I mean, uh, maybe you know what it's the pottery I've, just say it's the pottery I've class. been divorced maybe that's why maybe I've learned to let go of all my anger but it, it's just you know you can't I mean as a business owner you can't be worrying about the past right you can't yeah. be bitter about this opportunity happened or that happened you know you like where is that going to get you yeah and I'm not being like rah rah, you know, positive thinking or self improvement, but it's a reality, right? If you're yeah. going to run a business, you have to be pragmatic. You can't be living yeah. in an ideal world, or you're going yeah. to fail as a business owner. Yeah. So, on the flip side, Sal, the proudest moment. What's been the proudest moment for you? Uh, proudest moment. Um, hmm, proudest moment. Um, I would say my proudest moment was I bought my my first uh, real paycheck, which was an arbitrary number in my head. Uh, but was was five figures. The first five figure paycheck I got, uh, I gave it to my mom, and I basically bought mm. her a diamond ring. This was wow. You know, I'd always as a as a kid, I'd always been very mouthy, and I was be like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna make you proud, blah blah blah. I'm gonna do all this. I'm gonna get you this. I'm gonna get you this. So actually, having a, a check in my mm. hand or that amount deposited, or, that was a check actually, and mm. then you know giving it to my mom. and and this was very specific for a diamond ring. This was not like for anything else. And this is beyond mm. the idea of diamond rings are rip off or not. But it had been always this thing for my mom. So yeah. to get her this, you know, VVS, like the best one carat yeah. uh, diamond ring was, was kind of awesome. That's amazing. And none of my siblings can say they've done the same. So I can always lord that over them anytime there's any doubt about who's <laughs> the best of them all. Um, mentors. You know, I read that one of your heroes was Arnold Schwarzenegger and you actually get to work with him. Yeah, so uh, I love reading biographies. There's yeah. my, you know, anytime people ask me what's your favorite self-help book or business book, I say there's not a single one. I always read biographies because you hear about their struggles, you hear about their their turmoil to get where they are, right? Yeah. So Steve Martin, for example, um, in his biography, he talks about how he'd record himself and then he'd listen to himself hour for hours afterwards picking out the littlest nuances and mistakes he had made. Yeah. I can't even imagine listening to this more than once, right? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm tired of my own voice. So I love biography. So Arnold is a great one where, you know, everyone thinks of him as this bodybuilder who then stumbled into acting, who then whatever. But he actually made his first million off real estate, right? right? And he said to himself, now I've got my money from real estate. I can do whatever I want. And that whatever I want happened to be acting, right? So that's always been very inspiring. And also, you know, he was an immigrant. Um, he was a fish out of water. Like my first, I came here for high school. I was so uh, just awkward, I think is the right word to use. I was just totally did not fit in. I did not know what was going on. Just massive culture shock. Um, but, you know, he came. He was a fish out of water, but he didn't care. He did what he wanted to do. He worked hard. He made his money. And that allowed him to do whatever he want. And yeah. I've kind of, on a much, much, much smaller scale, I've kind of done the same thing, right? I was a fish yeah. out of water. I did what I wanted to do. I believed in it. People doubted him all the time, right? With his accent yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I made my, my money and now I get to enjoy life and, and do whatever I want when I want. So yeah. that's always been, uh, uh, I, I, can't, I can always say I haven't had a direct, a lot of direct mentors, um, but I've always had uh, these aspirational figures and reading their stories has always been very yeah. inspiring to me. Yeah. How was it for you though that you're an advisor for their fitness site? It's, uh, it, it was kind of random. It was, it was cool. Um, it's uh, it, it was very geeky. I think is 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 the right way to say it, right? And, and just being even my random friends noticed it. Like, yo, Arnold is following you on Twitter. I'm like, yes, this is true. Or, or I, I do remember in terms of t uh, tweeting the the last time uh, he tweet or any times he's tweeted me with my my handle in it. Just seeing the tweets that are sent towards Schwarzenegger are hilarious, right? Like. <laughs> they show a part of humanity you would not normally see. I think is the best way to, to phrase it. So it's been just, it's been very cool. I, I think that's yeah. the best way yeah. to, to sum yeah. it up. So this has been fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm sorry you have an uh, event with your girlfriend because this could go on for another hour. But um, where should we point people towards? Where should they check out online for your your sites and you? And I didn't even get to, to say my, um, uh, my statement about SGO because I felt it was... Like I felt it was so interesting when I hit that page and I had a lot of comments on that. But that's right. for another time. 
Um, right. Yeah. So yeah. So the, the best your intensity place is- on that page, like people should just check out SGO. <laughs> oh, sorry, SJO dot com. SJO dot com. It's an yeah. intense page. It's intense. It's, uh, I don't know how I else mean, to describe it. The reality is, uh, I've tried to keep a relatively low profile, but for especially for examine as it's as it's star has skyrocketed up people want to talk about the business side of it right so yeah. i've had to talk about the business side because curtis and kamal are not we're not in that in that area yeah. so you know that's got me in men's fitness got me in, uh, in forbes and all these other magazines yeah. so people have followed me and there's a bit of a following um so they frequently email me or message me or ask me about entrepreneurship and whatnot right. and the reality is that most people selling entrepreneurship online have never had any success themselves you know people selling passive income how to make passive income websites when they're making three thousand dollars or two thousand dollars a month as their full-time job and they talk about it all the time and again I don't want to be mean but I feel like if you're making under fifty thousand which is not even the median income in Manhattan like you should not be self-styling yourself as an expert right I will also be the first person to say I'm not an expert but at least I've had a modicum of success and I have some experience. So SJO.com uh, is just a place for me to not just talk about what yeah. I've learned in entrepreneurship, but research, right? So yeah. to, uh, last week and a half, I've spent about 10, 15 hours researching about topography on websites, right? Readability, how what about line height, line spacing, um, you know, different fonts, sans serif versus serif, headlines, all yeah. that kind of stuff. So it's really a, a repository for me able to... And, and so I got about three to five people a week saying, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So SJO.com is just an outlet for me to be able to say, hey, yeah. just go look on the website or, hey, you know, this is what my thoughts are on this or, or this is something I think people are not are thinking about. So, yeah, SJO.com to see me. My Facebook's there. My Twitter's there. I'm usually very accessible unless for some reason you do something really idiotic. So, yeah, feel free to, <laughs> free to say hi or, or anything in between. Examine.com, SJO.com. Saw any final words or lessons that we should leave people with on this uh, entrepreneur journey? I, I would just say that, just remember what the end goal is. And I personally don't think it should be money. Um, I sh- it should be towards whatever is more important to you, be it a hobby, a lifestyle, traveling, whatever. Aim for that. And once you achieve that, then you know, you're know you kind of where you were trying to go. Instead of just trying to make a, a $10 million business or a $100 million business or unicorn these days right, with a billion dollar startups. Yeah. That's, that's usually my, mo- uh, my advice to entrepreneurs. Because yeah. most of them don't want to be running a thousand person um, business, right? They want something very specific, the freedom or whatever that they're looking for. So chase that, don't chase the the money. Yeah, love it. Thanks, Sal. Much appreciated, always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out.